Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's briefing. My name is Carol Werner, and I'm the Executive Director of EESI, the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. For anyone who is not familiar with the EESI, we are a nonprofit organization that was set up in 1984 by a bipartisan group of members of Congress who cared deeply about energy and environmental issues, wanted to find a way to provide additional resources to members of Congress in a bipartisan way to further explore issues around energy and environment, problems that needed innovative solutions, and ways to get solid, credible, timely information to policymakers. So that is what our role has been uh, throughout these <clears throat> past few decades. And so we have always sought to uh, work closely with people also at the state and local level so that we can learn about what kinds of things work, um, how we can learn from all of those living laboratories, what kinds of information do policymakers need in terms of looking at the issues coming before them on energy and environment, and how can we best build bridges among across, across the sectors and across all levels of, of government. So today, we are taking a look at the topic of electrification, options for consumers and the environment. So electrification is something that many of you may have been hearing a lot more about. It's, there's certainly been many more articles, stories being written about electrification. And you've probably been hearing about it mostly with regard to thinking about uh, greater electrification in our transportation sector. But there are many aspects with regard to electrification, and I should also tell you that within a whole variety of groups, uh, organizations have their own nomenclature with regard to thinking about electrification. And so you will find that, for example, our first speaker who comes from EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institute, EPRI talks about it as efficient electrification. While on the other hand, you will hear, you will also be hearing today from NRECA, the National uh, Rural Electric uh, cooperative Association, they talk about it from uh, using the terminology of beneficial electrification. What's critical is that with regard to how we are talking about electrification today, and in terms of these organizations, the, the point of the whole thing is to look at electrification from the aspects of how it can truly provide greater options to consumers that make sense for them on, uh, on an economic and on, on an access side, as well as providing an overall um, uh, environmental benefit uh, to them and to the environment at, uh, at large. So to start off our discussion today, as we hear about this and what's really going on with regard to this whole topic, how is it being approached? Why does it matter? Why should we be concerned about it up here on Capitol Hill? What does this mean to constituents across the country? So to start us off, we're going to first hear from Barbara Tyron, um, who, <clears throat> as I mentioned, is the Executive Director for Government and External Affairs with EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institute. And Barbara there is the principal liaison between EPRI uh, executive management at the Congress, the administration, uh, other national trade associations, the national leadership of the state public utility commissions, um, as well as state legislators, regulators, and the Washington energy and policy community overall. So she has that job of keeping her pulse on kind of all of the things that are moving in this important policy space. And EPRI is, is very well known for all of its, its research, its conferences, uh, its journals, and how it has really pioneered um, in looking at, at approaches around electricity in innovative ways uh, over the last many, many decades. Barbara?
Thank you, Carol, and thank you all for being here. I'm Barbara Tyron, as Carol said, from the Electric Power Research Institute. And I'd like to take a show of hands, please, and ask you, who's heard of EPRI before today? Oh, my goodness. Okay, that's, <laughs> that's great. I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that. For anyone who doesn't know, we were founded about 45 years ago to conduct the research and development for the electricity sector. We're a nonprofit organization, and our work spans everything related to the generation, transmission, distribution, and then end use around electricity. Uh, we're today a global institution in th over 30 countries. Uh, and it's continuing to expand internationally. Uh, actually, since we're here up on Capitol Hill, it was Congress that actually came to the utility leadership uh, 45 years ago and the Public Utility Commission leadership, and they said, this was after the outages in the, uh, the Northeast, they said, you're going to have to do something about this because if you don't, we'll have to step in. And so that's when they created EPRI. So that's, that's our origin and how we were founded. So again, thank you so much for the chance to be here and to talk for a moment about electrification. We use the term, let's see if I can get that, there we go. We use the term efficient electrification, as Carol said. And when we say efficient, it's because we want to use less electricity where we can so we can use more where we should. And let's ex expand on that concept now. So as we look on the screen there, there are a number of applications for electricity. Of course, we're all familiar with the, the lighting uh, area and appliances. But what I'm going to be focusing on today is the opportunities in the transportation sector, as well as the opportunities that are coming along that some haven't even been created yet. So we will delve into that now. Now, as a research organization, we always want to have a technical foundation for the work we do. We are ultimately are scientists and engineers trying to come up with objective technical information. And so in keeping with that, the technical premise for all of this electrification work is around the convergence of many sectors. With advanced meters, data is being generated. And that is happening not only in the electricity sector, where as of 2016, 50% of homes or businesses had advanced meters that were generating data, smart meters sometimes people call it. But we're also seeing that in the natural gas sector and in the water sector, they also are advancing with new technologies that will have smart meters. So with that, all this data is now being generated across electricity, gas, water, telecommunications. It's all converging. So how do we take that data and make it valuable? How do we translate that into something that can improve the performance of all those systems, reduce the cost of operations, and be environmentally sustainable across all those different sectors. That was how we started our work in electrification. So beginning to look at what's happening with transportation, you see there on the screen, hopefully, that in February of last year, we were uh, approaching about 700, 800,000 cars that had been sold that were EVs. Actually, in October, October 31 of this year, we celebrated the one millionth electric vehicle sold in this country. So you can see that that trajectory means that we're going to be continuing to see more electric transportation in the years ahead. Now, why is that? Well, we know, our technical researchers know in this space, that actually having more choices in the marketplace drives customers to EVs. Uh, we started, as you probably all remember or know, that we only had a couple of different models and makes available. But now what we're seeing is that by 2022, there will be over 90 different choices. And customers, interestingly, resonate with more choice. And so that is actually driving EV penetration in this country. 
Similarly, we're also seeing the range of the battery increase from what used to be 35 to 45 miles now expanding up and out. And so that increases the security that customers have in trying an electric vehicle because they don't have the what used to be called range anxiety. They're not worried about sort of quote unquote running out of gas somewhere because they know they have many miles before they have to charge. And that increases their comfort level when they're converting to electric transportation. So as we look ahead, we know that we're going to have more choices, more models coming forward. We know that the battery range is going to increase. Autonomous driving, interestingly, is driving a lot of this, no pun intended, driving a lot of this um, because what it happens is the technologies are very compatible between autonomous driving and electric transportation, so they couple with each other very well. So we're seeing that, which frankly no one predicted 20 years ago, but that's essentially what the factors are going into the marketplace today. And then finally, uh, because customers don't like to spend a lot of time charging, while what we're looking at is a possible level three charging, which is very fast charging, so you can drive in and out much more quickly and recharge your car. So with all those developments, we see a very bright future for electric transportation going forward. One of the ways that we see a bright future actually happened in Korea last year at the Olympics. Now, I think everybody knows that that's an ice rink cleaning machine. Um, they are actually called Zambonis. They were uh, created in 1949, and they have been cleaning ice ever since 1949. But what happened last year at the Olympics in Korea was that for the very first time, it was an electric Zamboni. And so you can imagine if you're a world-class athlete, you don't want to have a diesel engine indoors cleaning the ice. You want to be able to have pristine air indoors. And so with that, the Zamboni became electric. And so we're uh, very pleased within the EPRI family to see this development. We're also seeing a new area, which is indoor agriculture. And what is happening is that with LED lights, they can replicate the same kind of lighting that the sun can, but you can do it more effectively because you can monitor plant growth in ways that you couldn't do in just in a typical outdoor setting. And so with LED lighting, we're finding a number of benefits such as, again, cleaner air. They use 90% less water if they're grown indoors. You don't have to use pesticide. And furthermore, you can put these indoor facilities anywhere, and that reduces the transportation of fruit, particularly fruits and vegetables, having to go long distances. That helps then, that reduces vehicle emissions out, and also the cost of transportation, but it also then enables the food to be fresher when it arrives for the customer because the distance has been so short. So we're seeing a lot of applications and possibilities around that. If anybody here would like to see a, a, an exhibit of what, of what that looks like. Senator Murkowski's office across the hill actually has an exhibit, and so she has an indoor ag uh, uh, exhibit over there, so feel free if you're on the Senate side to go over and see it. Now, I talked about the fact that we're looking at vehicles, and then we're looking at some of the new areas, and so we, I think, all are familiar with Bitcoin, which is very energy intensive. And that's, of course, a new phenomenon. Blockchain, again, energy intensive. And also what we're seeing is that we can use augmented reality, which is a new application for electrification. So rather than assume there's a power outage, uh, that there's been a storm, and the typical process today is that the utility will send workers out to the field. They'll go out and take notes and review the damage and try and understand what's happened. And then they will go back in their truck to headquarters, get the proper equipment, and then go back out and fix the problem. Now with augmented reality, they can wear a headset that actually will scan the damage done it after the power has uh, gone out and figure out what the problem is, what equipment is needed, and furthermore, send the GPS locators back to headquarters so you have precision around that and you're not trying to remember, like, what street did this happen on? But you can actually, in real time, radio all that information back so that the trucks can start rolling to do the repairs and you save several hours of time. So it's not a sequential process as it is traditionally with note-taking trips back and forth. It's all happening in real time. And so this is an area where we're running pilots around this now, 
but we see this as being a huge area where, again, we can begin to use new applications for electricity and also the restoration of electricity. Now, um, EPRI's been working in this area for quite some time. On April 3rd of last year, we actually re uh, released a national electrification assessment at the, at the National Press Club, uh, talking about what, what are the trajectories going forward around electrification, what can we hope to expect here, and, and what is really scientifically possible. And the conclusion was reached that end-use elect electricity will continue to go up. I mean, you all have devices that didn't even exist 25 years ago, and, and, and we anticipate in 25 more years there'll be many more of those kinds of devices. They're all electricity-based. So we will see an increase in end-use electricity, but we also will continue to be using natural gas in the end-use sector as well as a fuel for generation of electricity. So there's actually a, a sort of a win-win situation here going on where we will start to see the benefits of electricity with lower costs, with affordability, with uh, increased uh, environmental sustainability, but we will also see that other fuels will play a role going forward as we look out. So what does that all mean? We see that the customer is going to be driving a lot of the decisions. The customer wants more control. They have control in other areas of their life through all those devices we just talked about that you own and operate, so they want to have more control around the electricity sector as well. Not everyone wants to have that, but some will. And so what we will need to do, because the customer base is not monolithic, what we will need to do is to make sure that those who want that and want to exercise that choice will have the ability to do so. Those who prefer to let it be managed by someone else will have the ability to do so. But they will have more choices around that. They will be able then to control their costs. They will then be able to have presumably a more comfortable environment because they're regulating it themselves. The system should be operating even more cost effectively with all this data and information cycling through it. So there are a number of customer benefits associated with energy management of the future. And with that, we look forward at EPRI to shaping that future of electricity with you. So thank you so much. Thanks so much, Barbara. And as, as Barbara indicated, we are just seeing so many changes um, in terms of technology applications where so many uh, technologies um, are becoming ever more efficient, things are, uh, well, I guess the only constant really is change. And that, as, as Barbara also indicated, there, I think that there are so many things on the horizon that we can't even conceive of yet. So this is all going to be quite a grand adventure. So we are very delighted to be joined today by someone from Western Wisconsin, uh, that Steve Kep is here with us. And Steve is a founding advisory board member of the Beneficial Electrification League. He brings uh, over 25 years of, of important experience dealing with, with uh, you, the electric utility industry to develop new opportunities for leading edge energy efficiency and renewable energy technologies. And he has particular expertise um, in this whole evolving electric water heating, demand response, renewable storage, and beneficial electrification markets. Welcome, Steve. Thank you, Carol. Good afternoon, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to be with you today. See, here we go. Um, as, as Carol mentioned, um, we're approaching electrification um, in, in a similar fashion, but not necessarily from the uh, direction of research. We're uh, focused more on application, uh, public awareness, market development, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, the uh, Beneficial Electrification League, who I represent today, uh, was formed uh, late last year uh, by a partnership between the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association and the Natural, uh, Nat Nat Natural Resources Defense Council. And um, you might not think that an electric utility organization and, a, and an environmental organization would be teaming up together to promote electrification, but that, 
But that's exactly what's happened, and, and a lot of this has come from work that was done to uh, develop a, a, a grid-enabled product category a few years I'll, and I'll, I'll, a few years ago, and I'll touch on that. So, uh, as an introduction, um, you know, Carol mentioned my my experience, but I just wanted to share that you know, I, I started out as an environmental studies major and an energy auditor. Um, I, I put in solar hot water systems, and um, you know, I was on I was on the cutting edge of all this technology in 1985. So we're, uh, we're, uh, we've, made, we've made tremendous progress, uh, but a lot of the things that, that we're working on today are similar to things that we were working on then. And it's, uh, it's, it's, been, uh, it's been a lot of fun to have the opportunity to interact with the electric utility industry for most of these years because by and large electric utilities are generally trying to do the right things for the right reasons, and I've found that a, a compelling proposition in, in my career. Um, Building a little bit on what Barbara mentioned about research, there's also some research being done by the uh, National Renewable Energy Lab, and I think EPRI is, is a partner in that. But uh, I had the opportunity to be on a program with a gentleman from, uh, from that organization uh, uh, last fall. And, uh, and in his, we were talking about electrification specifically, and uh, he made the point that you know, through, uh, through their work, you know, they're looking at a variety of electrification futures, um, Reference, a reference point, a medium electrification future, and a high electrification future, and I, I can I can tell you that I'm I'm only interested in high electrification futures. I think that's that's where the action is, that's where the opportunities are, and I think that um, we're we're moving into I guess what I would call a second age of electrification. That would help a little bit. Thank you. Uh, my parents um, grew up on, on farms in, in rural Minnesota, and they grew up on farms that had no electricity. So the first age of electrification was rural electric cooperatives bringing electricity to the farm for light bulbs and electric motors and everything else. The second age of electrification that, that we're entering into now is, is bringing electricity not only to people who've never had it, but also uh, bringing the full capabilities of electrification in terms of all the new technologies that are, that are available to uh, to use this resource. Nobody buys electricity with the idea that I'm going to use a kilowatt hour today. We buy it for what the electricity will do for us. And it's heating and cooling and hot water and, and electric transportation. And I think that um, as, as, as people understand that better, they begin to understand that it's important to know where your electricity comes from, how it's made, and uh, the fact that our grid is getting greener, and the fundamental fact that everything plugged into the grid is going to get greener right along with it. That's a basic concept that, that people can understand and, and can take into consideration when they're um, thinking about whether they want to uh, put in a, um, a central AC system or, or an air source heat pump. But the last thing I'll mention about uh, National Ren Renewable Energy Lab is that he made a very important point that I had not considered in, in all of my work on this is that Electrification is a global megatrend. I mean, this is not just happening in, in the United States. This is it's in China and India and all, all over the world. Uh, people are working on this second age of electrification and what we like to call beneficial electrification. So the Beneficial Electrification League was formed uh, late last year, and uh, we, we were formed for one purpose, and that's to promote beneficial electrification. Uh, there are a number of organizations that are dedicated to research, uh, we're very much focused on public awareness and, and public engagement and, and, uh, and public policy. So we more or less developed a definition that, that we thought we could use to convey to people what our, our understanding of beneficial electrification is. So very simply, it's the application of electricity to end uses that would otherwise use fossil fuels, where it satisfies at least one of the following conditions without adversely affecting the others. It saves consumers money over time. So that, that lends to the efficiency aspect of, of electrification. It benefits the environment. It reduces greenhouse gas emissions. That, that speaks directly to the greening of our grid and the fact that more and more of the electricity we get comes from carbon-free sources. It improves product quality or, con, or consumer quality of life, and it fosters a more robust and resilient grid. All of these are important. If we can, if we can satisfy one of these without adversely affecting the others, we think it's beneficial electrification. Um, I, I, won't, I won't hit every one of these points, but uh, a lot of this is, is directly developed from work that 
um, that Keith Dennis has done and, and others to uh, introduce the idea of environmentally beneficial electrification. Uh, we started promoting this idea through the Peak Load Management Alliance a couple years ago. Uh, we were very excited to, to be at the EPRI conference in Long Beach in August. They drew 1,800 people to Long Beach in August for an international conference on electrification. It was tremendous. We have a, we have a website you can visit, uh, beneficialelectrification.com, and uh, you might ask, uh, what kind of a league are you going to have around beneficial electrification? Well, it, it's not so much that uh, we have a, a league structure, it's more or less that we have a league idea, which is that everybody plays. I have a grandson who plays baseball, and I went to one of his games, and I noticed that you know nine, nine guys play the field, but everybody bats. I thought, what a great idea. I wish they had had that when I was coming up, but this is, this is where the idea of a league came from, is that everybody has an opportunity to participate. And along those lines, that's how we came up with this electrification ambassador program. So if, um, if, you, if you ever get one of my emails, you'll see I'm, I'm self-identified as a beneficial electrification ambassador. I mentioned that it started with electric, uh, electric water heating, uh, the work that we did to develop a grid-enabled product category when the Department of Energy wanted to force the entire market to heat pumps. Not so much that we don't like heat pumps, which we do, but uh, the fact of the matter is that there were about uh, over a million controlled electric water heaters around the country that would need to be replaced at some point in time. And, and at, at the point that uh, electric heat pump water heaters were being introduced, they weren't a plug-in fit everywhere in the country. So we needed to be able to be able to uh, replace those water heaters when needed and to continue to build those demand response programs. If you look at the country in terms of electric water heating market share, which is what a lot of what I've worked on for, uh, for a number of years, you can see that it's highest in the south, uh, and they say, you know, the west, uh, so is 26 percent, but in the Pacific Northwest, it's higher. Um, but uh, a point of reference, in California, where it's probably closer to 90 percent gas water heating, they've got a full-blown effort to electrify their, their, their water heating sector uh, over the coming years. So um, uh, even, even California is, is moving in, in the direction of beneficial electrification for water heating. And the water heating resource is, is, is huge. And if, uh, with 45 plus million electric water heaters around the country, they pretty much operate as needed. But if we can coordinate that usage and dedicate it to off-peak times when wind energy is cheap, we can change the carbon footprint of, of electric water heaters all over the country by maximizing the amount of renewable energy that we get to them. So this um, water heating has, has an important role to play uh, in this electrification future that we're talking about. Just to give you an idea of how important it is, uh, PJM, uh, the uh, regional system operator um, in, in the Mid-Atlantic and, and New England, uh, in 2017, uh, I think 69% of, of their uh, regulation registrations were, were electric water heaters. So it's, it's huge in that market, and it's, it's, it stands to be that large and larger in a number of other markets as well. So the league recognizes that electricity is getting cleaner. It's getting less carbon intensive. Um, electricity production also is becoming more intermittent and variable. So the grid needs to get more sophisticated. Consumers are getting more sophisticated. As Barbara mentioned, they want to decide when they use energy. Can they use energy uh, when, it's, when it's greener? Can they use it when it's cheaper? Uh, they, they want to be able to do all of those things. And our, our climate change goals and, and our climate responsibilities are not going away. So we need to be able to work together to, to manage um, this effort uh, for the benefit of all of us. We think that beneficial electrification is, is an effective and a very inclusive greenhouse gas reduction strategy. Everybody's making decisions on a day-to-day -day basis for their home. Are they going to, what, what type of water heater are they going to put in? Are they going to put in an off-peak um, a uh, grid interactive electric resistance water heater? Or are they going for a heat pump water heater that is twice as efficient as, as electric resistance? Uh, decisions on replacing uh, um, central AC systems. Do they just put in a more efficient AC system or do they upgrade to a heat pump where they can get some high efficiency electric heating in the shoulder months in the spring and fall? So these are messages, messages that we think are valuable and that uh, that we're trying to move into the marketplace. We work with a number of stakeholders, as I mentioned, not just utilities and environmental organizations, but manufacturers and policymakers all across the country. Um, immediate opportunities, uh, electric vehicles are getting, I think, the, the bulk of the attention in terms of electrification. 
and it's not a space that we as a league feel that, that we probably have a lot more to offer except to be supportive of those efforts. Uh, we think our, our most effective area is going to be electric space and water heating. And also, you know, those similar technologies is in commercial environments, and then there are also a number of um, electric technologies that hold great potential in the industrial space and agricultural as well. So our objective is uh, to build a, a stakeholder coalition to promote the definition of beneficial electrification, uh, not just to uh, stakeholders and not just to industry participants, but also to the general public, to build strategic partnerships. Um, some of the work that we're doing, we're doing on a state-by-state -state basis. Uh, in November of last year, we did a meeting, uh, it was called Electrify Minnesota, and we drew a, a great crowd to uh, Great River Energy in, in, uh, in, in uh, Maple Grove, Minnesota, where we talked about the opportunities for electrification within the state. Coming out of that, we have requests from several other states to do similar meetings. Um, we are planning one in Wisconsin and also in Colorado and, um, we, and North Carolina all within the next three months. So um, the opportunity to work at the state level, we think, really fits well with, with how we can promote beneficial electrification. Uh, we're all trying to be active in promoting this. Uh, the idea of an ambassador program, if you go to our website and you buy into our principles, Guess what? You're now an ambassador if you want to be. There's not, uh, there's not a lead AP test or a certified energy manager test. Uh, beneficial electrification is, is a lot more simpler than that. So we're trying to establish a national presence for beneficial electrification going forward. And we're very much focused on public awareness and, and market development. And um, you know, going forward from the speakers that will come after me, you'll, you'll learn a lot more about the work that's being done by their respective organizations and, and us together as, as, as an effort. Um, coming to Washington, D.C., I want to quote Lincoln, that in this age, in this country, public sentiment is everything. With it, nothing can fail. Against it, nothing can succeed. Those are our marching orders. That's how we're approaching beneficial electrification, by engaging the public and trying to raise public awareness and get public sentiment behind the idea that electrification is, is, is the right future for, uh, for our country and for our utilities. Every time I go to Great River Energy in, uh, in Minnesota, on the wall, uh, they have the times they are a-changing um, from another Minnesota boy by the name of Bob Dylan. Most people remember the song. Uh, they remember that line of the song. But if you ever look up the lyrics, you'd be surprised uh, how, how far uh, advanced Bob Dylan's vision was in 1963, come gather around people wherever you roam and admit that the waters around you have grown and accept it that soon you'll be drenched to the bone. If your time to you is worth saving, then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone for the times they are a-changing. And I always add the line, we better start swimming or we're going to sink like a stone because the times they are a-changing. And with that, I will say thank you very much and look forward to your questions at the end. Thanks very much, Stu. We will now turn to Keith Dennis, who is with the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, where he is the Senior Director in the Business and Technology Strategies Division. Uh, Steve brings um, a long interdisciplinary background in engineering, business, and law, and works with NRECAs uh, across the board in terms of NRECAs legislative regulatory policy and technical teams on issues related to energy end use, um, which includes demand response and energy efficiency. He has published numerous papers on this issue of beneficial electrification and is leading this initiative on behalf of NRECA. Um, and he also is a board member of the Beneficial Electrification League that Steve just talked about. Thanks, Keith. Thank you. Well, I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. I love the EESI events. And um, I've, I've titled this Beneficial Electrification, Changing the Way We Think About Electricity. But I just want to reiterate the point. You'll hear folks talking about electrification. Sometimes they'll say electrification. Sometimes they'll say strategic electrification. Sometimes efficient electrification. But the idea is that we all have a shared vision of an electrified future. Um, we use the term beneficial electrification a little bit as a term of art. And that's what I think Steve was describing. Um, 
the uh, America's Electric Co-ops, I work for NRECA, we're the trade association for 900 electric co-ops. Uh, we were the folks who brought probably the first light bulb to Steve's uh, parents' farm. Uh, we brought the first light bulb to a lot of places in America during the, the, the New Deal. Um, we serve 43 million customers. We're in 47 states. Uh, you can see our map up here of, of where we are. Um, that, that kind of uh, uh, background of electrification, we have that in our DNA. And the idea that there's another wave of electrification coming that's part of the future of our energy, uh, energy system is really uh, exciting. Um, so I think that the, the, the message is that there's a lot of opportunity here, and I have some takeaways. I, the, the, the first thing is that there are a lot of stakeholders out there. If you read, like, academic papers or labs or different, um, different EPRI studies, um, there's a great amount of stakeholders who think that if you're going to meet aggressive greenhouse gas goals, you need to electrify more things. And the idea is that you can't really reduce greenhouse gases by a large scale if you're driving around in millions and millions of uh, vehicles that burn gasoline or if every house has uh, fuel oil and natural gas and, and there's diesel on every bus. I mean, it's just not going to happen. So the future that these folks put, the future that folks like NRDC put forth is, has these kind of pathways and the pathways go through electrification of what we can. And so that's sort of the, the genesis of this uh, this idea. Uh, and it's, it's happening because of a few trends. One, the emissions in the electric sector are just going down, 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 down. I'll show you a chart in a minute. Down, down, down. And the efficiency of devices, on the other hand, is going up, up, up. Think about light bulbs. You can't even really buy the old light bulbs anymore. Now you have CFLs or LEDs, really efficient. Heat pumps to heat your house are like 200, 300 percent efficient. So you have efficiency up, emissions down, and it's a double whammy, and all of a sudden, you're better off to choose electricity than you are to choose something else. We also need flexible loads because wind doesn't blow all the time and sun doesn't shine all the time. And when it's available, a resource, we need to put it somewhere. And one of the things you can do is put it into a car, put it into a water heater, take a shower later, drive later. It stores the energy. It's a flexible load. You don't have to use it right away. And that's, that's really another reason why we need more electrification to help integrate renewable uh, energy. It's, it's an important side of the equation to balance the grid. This scenario, as, as, as you see in the NREL study and, and the EPRI study, leads to situ situations where we're using more electricity, but overall we have fewer greenhouse gas emissions. So Steve mentioned our, our, the definition. We, we, we have an assertion that if, 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 uh, if you're saving consumers money, if you're benefiting the environment, if you're improving quality of life, if you're making the, the grid better, and you're not harming any of those, it's clearly a beneficial activity. Um, there might be some balancing that goes on, but clearly if you're saving money and you're not harming the environment, that's beneficial. If you're in, improving the environment and, you're not, and, and, and it's not costing you any money, that's clearly beneficial. And when you have that pocket of overlapping where people can all agree that's beneficial, you have the opportunity to incentivize that behavior to say that's a good thing. So, sort of like we, we encourage people to do energy efficiency. You can encourage people to do beneficial electrification. It's something that's in the public good. You reduce greenhouse gases, you save people money, you improve their lives. That's all something that we can strive for. And it provides a really good opportunity for groups like NRDC and NRECA, who aren't always on the same side of, uh, of every issue, to come together and say, this is common ground, we can work together on this. And that's what we need to do uh, in, in, in with complex things like energy in this country, work together when we have common ground. So the League has brought us together, really excited about that opportunity. Um, I like to talk a lot about the consumer-facing things like cars, water heaters, and space heating. Water heating be very important, as Steve mentioned. But cars are the things that people think of. Those are the things that you might want. You see your neighbor has an electric car, you're like, I want one of those electric cars, maybe, if you have the money. But y they drive fast. They're, they're good for the environment. They're cool, kind of cool, right? So the idea of why you like that electric car um, doesn't really translate to your water heater. Your water heater kind of goes out and you're like, is it gas or electric? Like, I'll go get one at the store, right? <laughs> but the idea needs to be the same. It's electric. If, if, if someone asked you what type of water heater is going to use renewable energy, would you know to say, hey, that's solar energy and wind energy. It turns into electricity. I need to get an electric water heater or else I'm not using renewable energy. The whole point of it's moot, you know? Um, I need electric space heating. I need... In the future, we're going to need to, to, to pick electricity if we're, if we're really supporting, supporting that type of future. Um, so uh, while, it's not, while it's not sexy or something to a utility, um, the ability to control when you heat water is actually kind of 
exciting. So um, there are reasons that, that electric technology has advantages, and, and um, not all of them are, are completely obvious to the consumer, and that's a challenge. This graph is what's happening, uh, one of the trends I mentioned with, um, with emissions in the electric sector. And you see the emissions are just going down, 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 down. Um, that's 2005 to 2022. And uh, the, the solid lines already happen. And what that means is that anything that you plug into the electric grid today is performing better than it did a few years ago, and it will perform better in the future, just by virtue of being plugged in. So if I plug in a water heater today in five years, it's actually performing better for the environment than it is today. And that's before I start changing the time that it's used or the, or the, or the fuel mix that's coming in. So um, we have that going for us. Um, some of the types of things that you can do besides uh, what we've been talking about maybe is um, diesel pumps out in farmland can be tur turned over to, uh, to electric. Um, saves a lot of money, reduces emissions from, from, from electric use. There's a lot of pumps out there that could be converted to, uh, to electricity. Space heating, there's folks out there who are on fuel oil. They burn fuel oil in their house. Get them on a, on a heat pump. They'll save money. They'll reduce their emissions. They'll be more comfortable. It's a win-win-win situation. Um, things that you wouldn't think of. This is a rock crusher in our service territory in Illinois. Um, by having uh, electric rock crusher, not only do you not have really loud diesel equipment with smoke coming out, um, but you're also able to crush the rocks better and have better product quality. And there's a lot of things that are electric that are better um, quality. I'd say like a lawnmower, you don't have to yank on it. It doesn't have smoke coming out. You don't get grease on your hands. You don't have to pour gasoline in it. It's, it's quiet. It, you know, you can have it like a Roomba someday. Um, uh, uh, propane, uh, propane forklifts, converting those to electric, they're not loud anymore. You don't need earphones. You don't need to vent it. If you're in a mine with, a, with an electric product, it's not burning gas. You don't need to vent the mine out and have all that condensation. There's a lot of things about electricity that are just um, make the quality of life better and the uh, product quality better. In the future, we'll see more opportunities on farms. Uh, John Deere has an uh, uh, electric tractor. That tractor could sit on the side of the field at night and take wind energy all night and charge, never have to use any more diesel ever again. It also matches up with other electric technology that can help do precision agriculture. So you can see if you need to actually water the, water the areas and, and, and connect it to the, connect it to the uh, Wi-Fi so you can, you can turn it off remotely uh, or, or, or broadband. Projects like uh, the SUNA project up in Minnesota where uh, a co-op will give you a free water heater if you buy into community solar so that your, your uh, water heating is tied to uh, solar energy use. Water, water heaters are actually pretty expensive if they go out, uh, $500, $1,000. If you can get a free water heater because it can be controlled in the time when, when the sun's shining, that can save you a lot of money and improve your life as a consumer. School buses, we already heard about school buses. Little kids sitting out in a, in a big thing of school buses, you know, some of them have asthma stuff, they're breathing this, this diesel. These school buses go on set routes. Electric school buses make a lot of sense for that reason. Um, you, can, you can charge them whenever you want, at night when the price is very low for electricity when there's nobody with their lights on. Put that energy in a school bus, drive it around all day. We spend $2 billion on fuel for, for school buses. We could cut that down to $1 billion if we used electricity. When you think of a smart home, all the cool things you can do. You can drive up in your car, your, your lights turn on, your security goes off, you touch your phone, your heat goes up, your refrigerator supposedly tells you when you're out of eggs, it puts your kids' artwork up there for you. All this stuff that your house can do. It's a smart house. That's electric stuff. That's, that's, that's not, you know, fuel oil and, and propane and things like that. It, we have a good future uh, of, of, of cool products, and it's not all to do with the environment. It's not, all, it's not even all to do with saving money. It's, it's what people want. It offers you a better quality of life. And so what's next? Um, I've been doing this for, for several years, and people were asking me, what's next? And I said, oh, you know, maybe cars, you know. And one day I'm driving to work, and all of a sudden I look around, and there's electric scooters everywhere. And I said, oh, how did I miss that? That came out of nowhere, you know. <laughs> these things, there's people fighting to charge them and, and all kinds of stuff. Um, you know, so I sort of started half joking around that what's next, electric shoes? And then I start seeing people going around D.C. and, like, like a wheel that they're just standing on. And, and then I go to, to Walmart and there's electric shoes like in the kids' sections that the kids can drive around on. And so you don't know what the future is, but I'll tell you what, the future's electric. It's not, you know, m my kids aren't going to be pulling some rope on their shoe and like getting gas shoes anytime soon. So um, I think that, that that's important for us to figure out what drives the consumer. How, if, if we have a shared goal of an electrified future, how do we get to that high, 
high penetration scenario, and that's what the league's about, and that's what, why we have these great partners helping us do that, and we'd love to help you do that too, so thank you. Thanks, Keith. And now we know who to ask about what's coming next, right, to catch all of those new trends. Um, so we are now going to hear from Derek Murrow, who is the Senior Director for Climate and Energy Programs at the Natural Resources Defense Council. Uh, Derek oversees NRDC's teams that analyze and advocate for federal level climate, energy, and clean air policies, um, both at the congressional and administrative levels. So welcome, Derek. Thanks, Carol, um, and thanks for the invite today. I, I, um, I'm going to be pretty quick because I think we want to make sure that we have some time for questions. Um, it was really great to have Keith lay out uh, some of the detailed, kind of exciting um, policy or uh, technology opportunities, and um, I wanted to step back a little bit and, and talk about the why. Um, why is this important? Um, and we've talked about some of the consumer choice uh, reasons and economic reasons and a little bit on environment, but I just thought I would put um, this electrification opportunity and need in perspective in comparison to some of the other uh, changes that we need to see in the economy to address the climate crisis and then um, talk a little bit about different policy frameworks and, and what the federal government could do to help push this along. So um, probably hard for a bunch of you to see this in the back, but this is a, um, a set of emission scenarios uh, from a couple different sources. Um, uh, the, the, the historic emissions are shown there economy-wide uh, in, in black, and then there's a dotted red line going up to AEO 20, uh, 2005, which is the forecast, DOE's forecast in 2005 as to what would happen with carbon emissions. Um, more recent forecast is AEO 2007 in green there, so you can see um, the forecast has been wrong significantly. Emissions are down significantly. We're making some real progress. We're not where we need to be. Um, we're not uh, on track. The power sector is making a lot of progress, um, but across the economy, we have a lot more to do. Um, we did an analysis uh, well, about a year and a half ago looking at deep emissions, uh, decar decarbonization of the economy and looking at an 80% reduction by uh, 2050. Um, one of the things that we have recognized uh, since the latest IPCC report is that's probably not enough. Um, you know, we probably need to get to net zero uh, by the middle of the century. And, and if you think about the U.S. current emissions and historic emissions, probably the U.S. should be doing better than that. Um, so I'm going to show you a little bit of that uh, pathways analysis that Keith alluded to, but um, we also need to figure out how to go deeper. Um, so we've we got a lot of progress to make, and uh, the electric sector is a really important part of that. Um, in, in this analysis that uh, we did looking at just getting to the 80% reduction number, um, there were three really important takeaways in terms of the, the technological change and the, the changes in the economy that we need to see to achieve these goals. Um, the, the three big efforts and, and kind of pathways, or some people talk about wedges uh, to achieve these emissions reductions, are energy efficiency across the economy, so doing uh, everything with less energy, so that's, um, and, and a number of the technologies Keith talked about do both. They're both more efficient and, uh, and running on electric. Um, but that's really everything from vehicles to buildings to uh, in industry. Um, then cleaning up the electric grid. So that's adding renewables, uh, you know, potentially other technologies like carbon capture and sequestration. Um, but really cleaning up the grid, that's a significant effort. We're making progress but have a, lot, a long way to go. And then the third big part, um, biggest wedge, is this electrification wedge. And, um, you know, in, in this... Uh, figure it's a little smaller than the others in yellow, but if we don't do as well on efficiency, we're going to have to do more on electrification. Um, so there's some interaction uh, but between them. And then we're uh, you know, really looking now at how would we close that gap and, and really get to net zero, which probably means ramping up all of these and then doing, doing more. Um, one other quick trend that I wanted to flag um, is 
that we're making tremendous progress in the cost side as well. And this is across many technologies, but uh, as we get back to the, at the end, um, to what the federal government can do, um, a lot of this has been driven by federal and state policy. Um, and you see research programs at DOE and utility programs really deploying new technology, building a lot of it, and getting out of the market. And we're seeing costs come down really significantly. So this is just a few examples where we see, you know, across photovoltaics, wind, electric uh, vehicle batteries, uh, LED light bulbs, you know, more than a 70% reduction in cost over 10 years. So really tremendous progress um, uh, across a range of technologies. So I don't think I need to spend a lot of time on the, you know, opportunity um, that's been well covered. Um, I, I would say, though, that um, you know, just to reinforce what Keith was saying, that, you know, it's, it's, this, we need to think about this very broadly. So there's like transportation and buildings are the obvious big categories of electrification opportunity, but it's, there are opportunities in industry as well. Um, there are significant uh, energy storage uh, opportunities that are electric-based. Um, that we're only beginning to evaluate. And so we really we need to think broadly about um, all the, the opportunities across the economy. Uh, federally right now, um, you know, I'm, I'm particularly interested in is there something in the infrastructure space and appropriation space that we could do on buses, for instance? Um, you know, wouldn't it be great if the, uh, you know, urban uh, reps and, and rural reps got together on school buses and transit? Um, you know, could we really ramp up an effort in that space? Uh, in, addition, in addition to all the infrastructure um, needs and opportunities that, that an infrastructure bill could uh, help deliver. Um, on the building decarbonization front, I wanted to mention a couple things quickly. Um, you know, we think about three components to building decarbonization. There's the, the energy efficiency of the building, so doing more with less, um, and lots of opportunities in buildings for that, from appliances to building envelope to, to heating and cooling. Um, obviously, electrifying from the cleanest fuel, so that's cleaning up the grid. And then really just want to reinforce that this demand flexibility that Keith alluded to is, is really key to make sure that we're, we're able to use energy at the right time. Um, I also wanted to flag on the um, natural gas side that, the, you know, some, some concern about um, what happens with natural gas uh, in buildings, and we do think that there's an opportunity for kind of renewable gas or, or power to gas. Um, I almost think of it as an energy storage tool going from, you know, renewable electricity to a, a, a gas that you can use more flexibly and, and, and store. Um, but, the, you know, there may well be roles for, for uh, uh, cleaner gas as well. Um, so on the policy front, uh, I, we, we think about a, all of our policy work kind of going in a cycle. Um, and this can be by technology or by sector. Um, and, and starting with research and development, um, DOE is the key um, actor here federally on research and development in the energy space, but, um, you know, programs to do basic science on lighting or heating and cooling um, to, to get that, to begin to get that um, technology from the lab out into the marketplace with demonstration projects. And then ideally the, the federal government and the state government comes in and, and helps move that technology from the lab to market in a more aggressive way with incentives. They could be tax incentives. You know, we've seen that, for instance, right now there's a need to re renew and, and uh, update the electric vehicle tax credit. Um, those, those, that, those incentives drive technology into market, get, get people across what, what folks call the valley of death, where you kind of, how do you get to commercial? Um, so really important part of the innovation cycle. And then ideally you bring in uh, standards or other, other tools, policy tools, to make sure that the technology is deployed more widely. So, um, you know, that can take on a lot of different forms. DOE has authority to do appliance and equipment standards that help kind of lock-in uh, levels of efficiency. We also see uh, vehicle standards like the, the Clean Cars program, for instance, that's really helping to, to deploy uh, cleaner and, and, and more efficient vehicles. Um, so just as an example of how this might play out, you know, you might, you'd have DOE working on uh, LED light bulb research. The utilities might have uh, incentives uh, through their efficiency programs to get those light bulbs out into the market, um, and then you could have a lighting standard that comes in to kind of make sure that everybody rises to that level. Um, 
So uh, again, just a flag in the near term on the, on the policy front. Um, I think there's real opportunity in an infrastructure bill. Uh, there's real opportunity in the tax space um, right now, and uh, then also opportunity on the DOE front with reauthorization bills and plussing up uh, DOE's uh, um, research and development uh, budget. So just a couple things to flag. Happy to talk in more detail about that if folks have questions. I'll stop there. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Derek. And a recurring theme also that I hope everybody noticed um, to, was how important the whole role of efficiency is so that the less energy we use is really, really important so that the, by becoming ever more efficient, the less we have to actually produce is, is really, really critical. And there are so many exciting changes underway. Um, before we uh, open Q&A, I also just wanted to mention for anybody who is following our briefings that on, and this all kind of fits together with this theme too, on April 1st, we will be doing a briefing with the sustainable um, talking about the Sustainable Energy Factbook, we'll be doing that briefing uh, with the Business Council for Sustainable Energy and Bloomberg New Finance. Uh, so we hope that you will look for that information because it all kind of fits in with this whole thing too in terms of looking at where investments, how investments are really changing, what we're seeing in terms of penetration rates with regard to uh, efficiency, renewables, and natural gas technologies, um, uh, both domestically and globally. So let's open it up for your questions or comments. And uh, do we have any to start? Okay, start here and then we'll go back here. Go ahead. And wait for the microphone. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kathleen. I'm in Congressman Curry's office. Um, I'm curious about the um, energy storage opportunities. So I liked what you had to say, you know, you're charging at night. Um, but what other opportunities are there for more storage? Go ahead. You might all want to talk about this. Go ahead, Keith. <clears throat> um, I'll just give you a little bit of history with, with our group. Um, the, the Beneficial Electrification um, League actually sort of came out of this group called the Community Storage Initiative. And I think everyone's sort of very familiar with the idea that, that you can have batteries for storage. But one of the things that you don't think about is that there's a lot of storage opportunities and sort of everyday things that are, that are around. So uh, 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 electric vehicle is a storage device. It has a battery in it. A water heater is a storage device. There's lots of thermal storage out there. Um, I think that there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in terms of low-cost things that we can store energy in. And that's sort of the, the flip side of the, um, the flexible load um, situation. So if I'm taking energy from, um, from wind power when it's cheap at night or from the middle of the day in California when there's negative pricing and putting it into a water heater, for example, I'm storing that energy there until I need to take a shower. If I'm putting it into a, into a car, I'm, I'm storing it there until I need to drive. If I'm, if I'm at, a, at a university and I I'm, and I'm have a th big thermal storage unit, I'm, I'm storing that. Um, so I think, I think what we need to do is, is, is look at the batteries as the costs come down, but also not forget that a lot of these other things really are energy storage, and there's a lot of opportunity for that. Um, and, and Steve, I don't know if he, he would have the, the numbers memorized, but 50 million water heaters, when you add it up, it equals a, a very large number of, of storage that we have just sitting in our basements with hot, it, with hot water alone. So. Is there anything on a larger scale uh, that's going on? Yes. And who wants – Barbara, go ahead. Yes, there is. So um, Keith's been talking about renewable energy. Of course, we at EPRI are supporting renewable energy research as well. And what we see is that with community renewable energy, you can have community storage, and that helps to amplify those resources so you have a 24-hour cycle. An example where that's happen happening in real life is Aliso Canyon in California, where they actually have some limited capacity around natural gas, and they are using storage to actually as a, as a source of fuel to actually bridge the summer months when they have peak load. Mm -hmm. Just really quickly, I, I, mean, I think one thing to think about that DOE could potentially ramp up is some, some of the longer-term storage research and, and needs to think about kind of interseasonal 
uh, storage. Um, you know, I think we can do a ton in the near term with, with what we have, but as you think about deep penetration of renewables and, um, you know, think about Minnesota and Wisconsin and the kind of plains wind resource and how, you know, it varies by season, we, we also need to be looking at some of that long-term interseasonal storage I heard, research. Um, something about basically the wind turbines would produce the energy and then somehow we would store it as air that is going into the ground and then it would be slowly released back up when we need it. Yeah. Is that feasible? Is that a Com compressed air storage yeah. is, a, is a technology, just like pump storage mm -hmm. in terms of using water that can be pumped at night when it is you know, not when that power is not needed, and then to release it during the day, you know, for for um, higher when there is higher peak demand, mm -hmm. um, and I think there are a whole variety of storage technologies um, that include, you know, in addition to batteries and the the technologies that we just talked about, that there are things like ultra capacitors that have a role. I think Derek's point about. Uh, the opportunity for looking at many more things, you know, like flywheels are used in a number of places too for, for very short-term storage opportunities uh, or needs, but that there are, I think, going to be really, really important opportunities and needs to look at a really um, broad, vastly emerging uh, area of technologies with regard to storage. It's all pretty exciting, right? Um, anybody else want to add? Okay, so we had a question right back here. Yeah, I have some concerns about what seems to be enthusiasm for natural gas because of what the evidence of harms from the extraction and the toxic chemicals used. So I'm, I have some concerns about that, and I also have concerns about indoor agriculture because it's the soil that determines the nutritional levels in the food and I don't see how growing food indoor I see and greenhouses still incorporate the original soil that um, is used to grow vegetables and fruits I don't see how that can be um, replicated in an indoor setting away from sunlight completely. So I have concerns about the quality of that. Um, and my, my other concern is that there seems to be a trend uh, toward replacing big oil with big wind or, or big solar with these huge solar farms. But there's a documentary entitled Garbage Warrior where he built affordable homes in New Mexico in the 1970s made of cob, straw bale insulation. There were wind turbines inserted underneath the roofs of the house. There were solar panels on the house. There was geothermal. And so these were off the grid, but yet on a small scale and have lasted the, um, in terms of the test of time because they're still there and they're still functioning as they were intended to function but some of his innovations have never been replicated. Um, thank you and I would just say you know I think it's really important to think about a whole broad swath of technologies and practices that that are going to be deployed and needed across so that it's never going to be sort of just one thing and either or. Barbara, do you want to talk mm -hmm. about it? Be great, thanks. So, so um, I heard th actually three different questions, if I'm correct, in, in what you just asked. So first, regarding indoor ag, what you can do is it's grown hydroponically, and as I mentioned, it uses less wa the plants use less water. Actually, the growth cycle is accelerated over growing in the ground. We find that a head of lettuce, for example, can mature w within five weeks. Nutrients are added to the to the growth structure there. And so um, anyway, we're getting very high quality um, lettuce. We actually have some at EPRI in, in one of our offices. And I can assure you there's a, a very abundant lettuce crop that's constantly available. So it's, it's been a very successful experiment. Um, regarding fracking, which is assume what you're talking about with natural gas. So if, first of all, at EPRI, we're completely fuel agnostic. We embrace all fuels that support the generation of electricity. However, we want to make sure that those fuel sources 
are cl as clean as possible and as cost effective as possible. And so we want to advance the technology to support our public interest mission regardless of fuel type. So we're not in the business of, of doing fracking, but we're trying to encourage and do research around ways that you can reduce emissions and improve the performance of electricity generation from all sources. Um, I sensed your last question was about community renewables versus rooftop solar. Is that correct? Uh, small scale versus grand scale. Versus large scale. Yeah. Yeah, so in that Where this architect had built his developments, um, everything he did has lasted. And it's not being replicated. So I, I think there, are, there is a room for small scale solar, wind, geothermal, integrated, um, that would reduce the cost, reduce the amount of land that might be needed to put these solar farms that have some problems attached to them. And I don't really see any downsides to doing it on a structure-by-structure structure basis. So uh, technology is changing rapidly. I think Keith talked about that. So whatever was done a, a few years or a few decades ago is probably being uh, evolving today. I'm not familiar specifically with what you're citing, but I can tell you they are introducing new technologies where you, for, for example, have a thin membrane on windows in buildings that actually then picks up the solar energy and it not only is, helps to insulate so you have a more energy efficient home or business, but it also is capturing that energy and then converting it into electricity. So there's all sorts of possibilities. Right, right. Uh, yeah, thank you, because I think, I think that your point is well taken that there needs to be a whole combination of looking at small scale as well as, as uh, larger scale and always trying to do things better. Um, question back here, okay. Hi, my name is Kevin Jarzomsky. I'm with the U.S. Energy Information Administration. And uh, I just uh, kind of following on with Barbara's comment about technology changing and also Derek's comments about uh, kind of the, uh, the, the future of energy consumption in the different sectors. Um, you know, I appreciate all of the, the research and analysis that goes into uh, estimating the effects of all these different technologies and what the, the future could look like. I know uh, for the annual energy outlook, for instance, it's you know, particularly tricky looking out through 2050. Um, and I just also want to remind folks what the annual energy outlook is. It's a, the annual energy outlook reference case is a projection, not a forecast. Uh, based on current laws and uh, regulations, current levels of R&D spending and uh, technology development. And so that, you know, when you're, when you're doing your, uh, your comparisons of looking forward, you know, be aware that technology will always move at a pace that we cannot always uh, expect. And look at LED lighting, for instance, that's a, uh, uh, the last uh, five, ten years of that alone has has advanced, has reduced energy consumption and lighting so much more than certainly than I would have expected. So uh, it's just very interesting to see how that technology has changed over the years. Great, Th thank you. And I must say, look at how fast Keith, as electric scooters have moved. But anyway, did you Hel want to say helpful, anything? To helpful it? clarification, thanks. Yeah. And uh, I mean, when I think about modeling and analysis and forecasting or scenarios, I think one thing we know is that we're always wrong um, across the board, and, and innovation happens. And um, you know, we're, we're we're trying to get a snapshot of you know what might occur. Um, so uh, really helpful clarification. Great, thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, in the back, Jeff. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm uh, Jeff Overton. For anyone on the panel, I wondered if you could comment on the changes and improvements that might be required for the grid to support uh, increased uh, electric electrification for all segments of the economy. Thank you. Why don't you all take oh. that? Go ahead, Barbara. 
I get. Uh, I can start, and then I'm sure the other panelists may want to add into this. So there were similar concerns, interestingly, in the 1950s when air conditioning was introduced into people's homes and businesses that, oh my gosh, you know, the system won't be able to support this. And in fact, it, it did. So again, uh, there are concerns today about that. But the system can be very flexible. First of all, we're making huge advances. I didn't, I don't, none of us have talked about this, but, but it's certainly relevant to the topic. There are huge advances in improving the distribution system and getting sensors that have the ability to communicate and are intelligent on the distribution system so you can now manage that load better, you can understand what the demand is better, uh, you have a better awareness of what's happening within that system. And so with all of those technological advances, uh, we're very confident at EPRI that we'll be able to accommodate electric transportation very successfully. Thank you for the question. Um, yeah, I, we hear this a lot that the folks are worried that if, if, you, if you start adding things to the grid, what's the investment have to be? Um, I, I think in where, where we're from in the, in, the, in the rural areas, there's a few things. One is you don't want to be adding all this load and not have it be flexible and have it be at the wrong time. I mean, if you added all, if you changed all the cars out in the, in the country to electric and had them all charging at the worst time, it would be a nightmare. You know, you, you, want, to, you want to make sure that we have the systems to make sure that we're, we're, we're integrating in a way that, that, that makes sense. Um, part of the, the beauty of the, um, of the little tests that we have or the, or the kind of definition we have for electrification is that if you are able to do it smarter in a more cost-effective way or better for the grid, you actually improve the, the, the electricity as, a, as an offering to consumers and you can improve that either it, it comes to you cheaper or it makes the grid grid better and it actually makes electricity more beneficial in more places. So it's really supportive of making sure we have those investments. But a lot of the times if you're in a, in a development in a rural area and somebody's like, I want to build, you know, I want to build a Walmart over here. It's not like, oh my goodness, how are we going to, you know, support this? It's like, okay, we'll do it. You know, it, we, we went from a time when we had no electricity to we electrified all the farms. People can add water heaters to their houses. A car is sort of like a water heater. Um, people can uh, plan to have a, a bus depot. People can plan to have an electric charger. Those things can be planned for. Um, the, the, the biggest challenge is going to be, you know, making sure that consumers are able to participate in some way in figuring out how to have a smart home and not just more and more peaky peaky loads at the wrong time. And that's, that's, that's something that, that I think we're, we're, we're working on and it hasn't been a, a, a huge issue yet. Completely agree with all that. One thing to add on is that policy making really matters in this space too, uh, whether it's at the state level with rate design and, and thinking about sending the right signals to customers um, or at the FERC level, um, you know, thinking about what kinds of technologies qualify and in the markets that they oversee or the planning processes that they oversee and making sure they're taking advantage of and kind of factoring in all these new energy storage or, or other opportunities. Um, the only thing I would add is that um, not only looking at uh, the grid in terms of its, its capability and flexibility, but it, you know, that one of the things that really drew me to this is that in, in, in the Midwest and other parts of the country, in spring and fall at night, there's so much wind there's so much available energy that prices actually go negative, which means they will pay you to take this energy. You know, so particularly if you're, if you're uh, charging up water heaters, and all of a sudden, instead of paying eight cents a kilowatt hour, you're paying two cents, or the co-op is paying you two cents to take that kilowatt hour of electricity. You know, so we have to, we have to think also not, <clears throat> not just the limitations of, of, of what the grid, which is is actually overbuilt for you know, for for worst case scenarios, but we have times where we have a, an overabundance of renewable energy, and we have to plan for those scenarios as well. And one of my, one of my members said, we used to say, what happens when the the sun's not shining and the wind's not blowing? And he said, what you really need to be asked, what what happens when it is shining and it is blowing? Now you, you got to get it somewhere, and and that's an opportunity. And uh, and people talk about equity in terms of you know how do you bring some of these these benefits to, to, um, to folks who maybe don't have lots of money. One of the, one of the things is taking advantage of those low-cost energy times can, can be a benefit. You could charge your car overnight, and if cars were the same price and you're getting an off-peak uh, electric rate, all of a sudden you're paying a lot less money to drive around in your car. So there's opportunities as well as challenges with all of this. And 
I would just add to that um, from, from previous briefings that we have done looking at transmission distribution issues, and it's been very clear that system operators across the country have, in terms of thinking about the grid and, and handling of renewables on the grid, because as these questions have come up, one of the things that uh, that they've talked about um, has been in terms of how much they've been able to really successfully integrate without any problems. So that while there are always concerns, um, at the same time we have seen an enormous amount of renewables put on the grid where it has been going very, very well. Um, and, uh, you know, from, from system operators' own perspectives, so which is also encouraging and all of that work obviously needs to really continue. Other questions or comments? Okay. Uh, Terry Hill, Passive House Institute. In the Green New Deal, there's a section that talks about retrofitting buildings. And um, in listening to a lot of these presentations, buildings are over here and electrical grids over here and something else is here. A lot of stovepipe stuff. Are you looking at the role buildings will play in the design of the future grid? So at NRDC, I think we think of, of our kind of core work around um, policy work as being focused on three major sectors. There's the, the power sector, transportation, and buildings, and buildings cross over. Um, and obviously, a lot of other topics, but those are, those are some of the biggest ones we need to tackle. Um, and I think a lot of what we've been talking about here today does interact with buildings um, and, and is very much um, focused on buildings. So whether it's the equipment in the building, uh, the efficiency of the building, uh, so that you get you can use less electricity, um, or or where the power comes from for the building. Um, you know the the buildings, whether it's residential or commercial, I think are are really essential to or, or industrial are essential to achieving all of our goals. And um, certainly at EPRI, we're doing research around the building envelope. Um, I think we've hopefully communicated here today that we've had huge technical technical strides in lighting over the last couple of decades, but we see the building envelope as the next target of opportunity. I will also uh, reference um, uh, heat pump technologies and you know, Keith had mentioned you know, the, the efficiencies continue to, uh, to advance and uh, using an electric heat pump water heater as an example for every kilowatt hour you get to that unit it moves two kilowatt hours of energy. A geothermal heat pump can move four kilowatt hours of energy for every kilowatt hour of electricity you get to it. And take it one step farther, what kind of energy are they moving? They are multiplying renewable energy. Heat pumps multiply renewable energy. That's the only technologies that can do that. Okay. Any other? Go ahead. What do you mean by multiply renewable energy? It means that if you, if you uh, supply a kilowatt hour of electricity to a geothermal heat pump, it's going to move, it's going to gather heat from the surrounding air, which is a renewable energy. But it's going to gather four kilowatt hours of energy and move it. And, um, you know, Another, another thing to think about in terms of our, 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 all of our air conditioning systems, AC systems, we take heat from inside the building, we dump it outside. Why aren't we putting that in a, in a water heater? I mean, there's, there's this dividing line between HVAC and plumbing that we have to get past. But there's, there's lots of efficiencies to be gained out there. So one, one more task that needs to be done by EPRE, by national labs, by DOE, is to look for those synergies so that we really do optimize design, engineering designs, how we do things. Because we're once again back to the point where the, the less energy that we need to use, the better off we all are. So efficiency is a really, really important point in all of this, right? Any last words from any of our panelists? Thank you. No thank last you. words. Thank you for having us. Then thank you all very, very much for being here. Really, really appreciate it and look forward to seeing you at our next briefing. Thanks so much. Thank you.